Good morning. Thanks very much for joining us. Um, we're going to be focused on innovation, data and prop tech, um, looking at the shorter term goals of, of getting back to business, but also some of the longer term trends in terms of innovation and what that may mean for the real estate sector. Um, we've got a super panel here today. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Richard Betts. I'm the group publisher at uh, Real Asset Media. Um, we run a series of events, um, newsletters, magazines, Real Asset Insight, Living Retail, um, The Real Asset Day. Um, and we also run a series of, of around 60 events a year, which have all moved online um, during the crisis, um, as well as some other new initiatives to help keep you connected during this period, um, such as Realcast, which is a kind of weekly um, analysis of some of the key trends of the week. Um, and we're also just launching RealX Global, um, which is a virtual exhibition and conference, um, which will launch 17th and 18th of September. Um, just, just bringing in um, VR, augmented reality, holograms as a way of really taking fairs to the next level um, and using the fact that it's virtual um, as opposed to a physical fair to enhance some of the things that you can do. Um, but let's let's introduce introduce the panel. Let's start with you, Michelle. And um, just give a give a very quick kind of one minute on on yourself um, and toolbox, um, and then I'll work my way around all of the all of the panelists so that then everybody knows who everybody is. Michelle. Thanks, um, Richard. Hi, I'm Michelle Buxton. I'm the founder and CEO of Toolbox Group. Our business is about creating communities in places and spaces within the built environment. We do it two ways, through experimental marketing, which is our toolbox marketing side of our business, encouraging people to engage with their space. And then we use PropTech, which is our Molcom product, to enhance communication, B2B, B2C communication, and drive efficiencies through operational management digitalization. Some very big words this for so early in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> That's super. Thanks very much, Neil. Hi, uh, my name is Neil Gmasmer. I'm based out of our European operations and I manage our Yardies international operations. A little bit about Yardie. We've been innovating for real estate for the last 40 years uh, and continue to do so across multiple different asset classes, whether it's clients that we service on the commercial side, so office, retail, industrial, residential, student, uh, co-working, flexible office spaces, and, and more. And it's just so exciting to be here, uh, Richard, with you and the, the panelists today. Super, great, thanks very much. Yasmina. Good morning all, my name is Yasmina Darbaniza and I'm a venture capital investor at Roundhill Ventures, a VC firm investing in early stage technology companies impacting the real estate and construction industries. So put very plainly, we invest in prop tech startups. So we spun out of real estate private equity firm, Roundhill Capital. So we have a strong real estate network and background from that and have invested in 15 prop tech startups over the last few years from Casafari in property investment, to Spacemaker, AI in property development, to Sensat in construction, to Plantific in property management, just to name a few. That's super, great, thanks very much. Um, Tom, and we should also mention, Tom, that you're joining us from New Zealand. <laughs> I am, the other side of the world, so it's not early in the morning for me, so those, Michelle, those big words were just fine. Um, <laughs> So I'm Tom Wallace, I'm the founder and CEO of Released. Um, so we founded the company back in 2013 uh, and we, we are pioneering the new era of commercial property management. So we strive to make commercial real estate more connected, more seamless and more simple for all parties. Uh, and we achieve this by building innovative mobile uh, cloud and data solutions for the industry. That's super, thanks. Um, and uh, and Anthony, um, just, just give a brief introduction of yourself, and then I know that you're going to you're going to share some kind of slides and some thoughts, um, just in terms of a of a way of kickstarting some of the discussion around around these topics. Okay, I'm uh, Anthony Summers. For twenty odd years, I ran various uh, prop tech companies before prop tech was was a a thing. Um, nowadays, I speak a lot, I write a lot, and I advise uh, prop tech companies plus incumbents. Uh, broadly on the impact of technology on future supply and demand for real estate, mainly commercial. Okay, so I'm just going to give a little bit of a talk here about sustainability, coronavirus and real estate, because yeah, 2020 has been rather, rather a surprise to, to all of us, and hasn't it? I mean, I, I was expecting to be spending most of this year talking about climate change and sustainability, but um, that lasted a couple of months and then frankly it's been COVID-19 all the way down 
as they say. But actually, um, being very, very much a glass half full type, type of chap, I think this is actually represents possibly the greatest opportunity um, for the whole real estate industry, but for, for particularly for the techno technology side of things, because sustainability, climate change and coronavirus actually are giving us a flywheel of change because when it boils down to it, to deal with one, we actually have to deal with the other. And the way to look at the, the pandemic is it's, it's, like a, it's like what um, anyone in tech would know is a, a forcing function. So it's a forcing function. It's forcing things to happen faster than they would have, would have done anyway. And I, I personally think that what we're looking at is five to 10 years um, change in the, next 12 to, in the next 12 to 18 months. So things are going to be pushed on at the most extraordinary rate. Now, the, if you look back to uh, this, um, Rahm Emanuel was um, Obama's chief of, chief of staff and previously was mayor of Chicago. And during the great financial crisis, he, he reiterated that you never let a serious crisis go to waste. And then he added, and what I mean by that is there's an opportunity to do things you could not do before. And I think this is part of the great opportunity. There are things that are going to be possible today that people have been trying to do for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, and haven't been able to do. And now they will happen absolutely over, overnight. So this is, this is what I thought would have been going on in the world. This is a, a quotation from Larry Fink, CEO of uh, BlackRock, in his letter to shareholders of January 2020. He was talking about a fundamental reshaping of finance based around climate change, driving a profound reassessment of risk, and we anticipate a significant re reallocation of capital. So I was looking for, the, for climate change to really become a big risk, a big thing, particularly as he wrote these five words, which are absolutely extraordinary in, in their power. Climate risk is investment risk. Now the point here is this is, if you like, the money talking. And when the money is bothered about their investment risk, things happen. So regardless of whether the money is in the slightest way interested in climate risk, because they saw climate risk is investment risk, you could be pretty sure stuff was, go stuff was going to be happening. And so, and he went on to say, our investment conviction is that sustainability and climate integrated portfolios can provide better risk adjusted returns to investors. Now, real estate was going to be absolutely in the crosshairs of all this, because we all know the real estate industry is an absolute environmental horror show. We, real estate uses 40% of the world's energy and is responsible for 30% of greenhouse gas emissions. In New York buildings, are responsible for 66% of greenhouse gas emissions. So we were very likely to see some sticks coming down there, some carrots coming down the line, but actually much more likely some really big sticks were about to be wielded. So for instance, the New York City um, uh, gov government mandated that buildings had to produce 40% less greenhouse gas emissions by 2030, and it was gonna start being measured in 2025 and you were about to get, you were going to get a very big slap if you didn't look as if you were on your way to, to, to moving. So a lot, of, a lot of stuff was happened. So that's what I thought was going to happen. And I could have gone on and on about that's where it was going to be. But this is what will happen. Because what is happening now changes everything. Because what people want in the future will not be what they wanted in the past. And actually forget the word want, what people demand in the future will not be what they wanted in the, in the past. And there's a big difference when customer demands something rather than they just want something. But there's two new zeitgeist changing norms going on at the moment. The first is that we now all realize that away from the safety of home, out there can be scary, it can be dangerous, and it can be unsafe. What we've also realized is it is actually possible for the whole world to go down at the same time. So people have been talking about this in climate, climate risk for a long time that, oh, well, it affects this country, but it doesn't affect that, that country. We've now seen how it, how it is possible for something to affect the whole planet at the, at the same time. But also there's a point of, smell that air. For the first time, there's hundreds of millions of people around the world who have smelt fresh air. This is Jalanda in Northern India. Now I am told that for the last 30 years, the Himalayas, which are 200 kilometers away from Jalandhar, 
are not visible, but suddenly they are visible. So extraordinary things are happening. So the pandemic is upending real estate. We've had 10 years of a bull market. Companies were optimized for the world as it was, and that meant there wasn't a lot of innovation because people criticize the real estate industry for not being very innovative. But the reason it wasn't very innovative is because it did not need to. Life has been pretty damn good for 10 years. Who needs any innovation? But now we are finding our offices, oops, they're empty. And actually, we know our customers never like them very much anyway. If you look at Leesman Index, roughly half of, half of the people surveyed, over 700,000 people in the Leesman Index surveys, said that they're, um, they don't believe their workplace enables them to be productive. And they're not used very much anyway. Now, we've known this before, but it didn't matter before because, well, it just didn't matter before. But on top of that, now people are actually scared of offices. So they don't particularly like them, and now they're scared of them. And oops, it turns out they might not even need them anymore. The great global work from home remote working experiment has turned out to be a lot better and a lot more successful than many people think. So this time is different. The, the entire real estate downturn playbook has to be upended because the typically as you go into a real estate downturn you would cut your overheads you would cut your capex you would cut your expenditure and you'd hunker down because the only thing that mattered would be to survive that's how it works in real estate boom that won't work this time you cannot do what you've done before this time because the lack of demand is not a cyclical market issue it's an existential health and safety one this time, the only way through the crisis will be to spend money. We're not going to save our way through this crisis. We're going to have to spend our way through this crisis. So we are going to have to spend our money on upgrades to ventilation systems, on new materials, hardware, fittings, furnishings, cleaning regimes, cleaning processes. We're going to have to spend it on communication, on data, on analytics, on interactions with our customers, on increased staffing, on new business models, and even new ideas about what constitutes the office and even work itself. So in a sentence, everything that we know we should have done over the last 10 years, but have not had to, we need to do now. And that's why everything changes, because what's gonna matter now Indoor air quality, we know air quality, we know the world around us can kill us. People are scared about going into buildings. They're going to need to, be, they're going to, need to trust the operator of a building that they're putting them in a safe and healthy environment. And we will not know that without having details about the indoor air quality. And the indoor air quality in an awful lot of commercial buildings is shockingly bad. It's just we never really cared before. Few people actually need an office. Need in the sense of, I need an office to do my work. The point is we have now got to make people want an office. And what has become clear from all the working from home is that on our own, we can work any, anywhere. It's, it's happened. All the doom mongers saying, oh, you could never work, you can't do anything from home. It's turned out to not be true. But what we miss is working with our teams, serendipity, collaboration. We need our teams and that's what the office is for. The office is distributed on a sliding scale. For, so depending what type of company you are, the percentage of you that all need to schlep up to a central business district each day is gonna be on a sliding scale and you're gonna find companies much more distributed, different parts of the company, different employees go to different places and work in different places at different times. We're going to have less office space, but it's going to be better. In fact, it's going to have much less office space, but it's going to be much better. This is completely analogous to retail. We're going to end up with a lot less retail, but the retail we end up with is going to be much better. And the flex market is the market. There's been an assumption that the flex market is a subset of the market. It's not. You're going to find everybody wants flexibility, regardless of size. And then to really make an office work, it's going to be a combination of the hardware of the building, the software that helps you run the building, and the services that are provided to the occupiers of that building. So if we start thinking of Office as software, Office as an iPhone, Office as hardware plus software plus services, that's where we need, need to go. So the winners in this new world are going to be whoever enables the bullet points I just mentioned.
Thanks very much, Anthony. Um, really, really interesting and sets us up very well, I think, for, for that discussion, not only about the role of technology um, in terms of, of us you know, getting back to, not necessarily getting back to work, because of course a number of people have been working throughout this, um, but how that Im impacts and influences the real estate side. One of the things I, I just wanted to pick up, let, let's start with you, Tom, if we can. Um, I mean, technology has been transforming the real estate sector um, and the expectations of investors, occupiers, guests, whatever we want to we want to call them. Um, the crisis has accelerated many of the trends. I mean, and, and Anthony rightfully picks up there, I think, the, uh, the ESG wealth, uh, the wellness kind of side of things. Um, do you think PropTech is going to see a significantly greater role um, and significance going forward? What, what's your sense of that? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. I think um, I think I really like Anthony's point there that um, we're now going into an environment where tenants don't need to be in the office, right? And every business owner has now learned very quickly how to measure output, uh, measure performance by output and not by presence. And they've learned that they can actually save quite a lot of money by doing it that way. So there's going to be a reduced need. So we really need to focus on how how do we get people to want to come and spend time in the office as well. But the, the really important thing right now is how can we make them feel safe when they're in the office? You know, that is, that is, a, that is the, the major thing right now that's focused. So there will be bigger focuses going forward, but right now it's on safety um, and they need to feel safe. So, you know, I think tenants, um, particularly if they're in larger office buildings, they're going to want to know things like what is the air quality of this building and, and not what was the average air quality of this building. Like what is the air quality right now, today, this hour, this minute? What is the density of this building? How many people are in this building right now? And what is a safe level for that? So it's no use saying, hey, this is a six star rated building and it was that way when it was built 15 years ago. They want real information and, and they want to be able to pull out their phone and understand that and make a decision if they're going to be in the office today or, or not. Um, so yeah, absolutely. I think it has a major part of that. And um, also for property owners themselves, um, they also realize that at any one time they can very quickly not have access to their office or their team. Um, they may have to work remote for a very long time. And so they need to be able to run their business, run their portfolio from wherever they are and wherever their team is, not where their office is. Um, and they need to be able to do that in a moment, at any one moment. So they need to make sure they've made those investments and it's no longer a, a nice to have investment to do that. They need, if you're not investing now, you're putting your business at serious risk. You know, in fact, it's it's most likely that you know your business is going to get in trouble. Whereas, you know, we sell software. We've always told these stories that you know this could happen. Um, I don't think we ever predicted a global pandemic as much as we were trying to sell. But um, you know, it's very obvious now that that can happen. Um, and, and everyone needs to make those decisions um, to make sure their business is um, you know is secure for for whatever might happen. Great. Um, thanks very much for that. Um, Neil, what's, what's your sense of that? I mean, obviously, Yardi well known as, as being involved in, in tech specifically, um, but also your role being international, you're seeing these trends kind of across the globe as well. Um, what, what's your sense of, of, of the role as an accelerator? Yeah, I think that one of the things that has come to the forefront based on the disruption that COVID-19 has had, unlike, let's say, 10 years ago from the GFC, is that all businesses were affected almost universally. So it wasn't necessarily in terms of a value or a, 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 a capital issue, but all businesses were immediately had to, to this awareness that they were going to be working from home. And so that, as that affected global businesses, and in particular then the sectors around real estate, I think one big awareness that came out was that all businesses aren't as digital as they think they are. So as companies had to overnight either have employees work from home, some businesses had to shut down, bills still had to be paid, you still had to take care of consumers and clients, et cetera. And so there was an awareness that, um, that, that their businesses weren't as digital as they could. And so I think that will be a driver that helps people look at how do they need to digitize their businesses more, which directly means in terms of investing in technology to do so. What is interesting to us, though, too, is that whereas we can talk about, you know, um, building environments and in terms of what we need to do to make the employees of corporate occupiers or the consumers of retail malls more comfortable, I think there's this reality that the amount of space that individuals need will most likely go down. 
And so the big impact then is in terms of the owners of real estate. So both on the office side, as well as on the, the retail side and in hospitality is space doesn't go away, right? I mean, that's the nice thing about real estate is that the market is always there to manage, but you have to then manage it differently and think about how you manage it differently. One sector that certainly has done better than the other three is, in, uh, is the industrial sector, right? So the demand in terms of as that's driven more online transactions, whether it's traditional e-commerce or other delivery type of services, that last mile of e-commerce has just the, the demand in terms of the valuations of, of industrial portfolios has gone through the roof and continues to be a large area, area of investment. No, I think that's interesting. I just want to share the results of a, of a quick poll I did, um, which is, do you think the health crisis has or will act as an accelerator for prop tech and innovation? Um, for those who are dialing in um, and can't see the results, um, uh, yes, a significant accelerator was 64%. Yes, there will be some acceleration was 36%. And no, things will stay on the same trajectory was 0%. Um, so uh, interesting, interesting points there, I think. Um, I just wanted to come to you, um, Michelle, if I can, just on the topic there that, that was raised also by Anthony, um, where he mentioned that the idea that office may be looking at some of the issues that have been challenging retail for a while. Um, what's, your, what's your sense of that? And because retailers obviously worked hard in order to try to create a sense of community um, and also an experience. What's your sense of that? And is that something that, that you see as crossing over into office or maybe something that office can learn from retail? I totally agree. I think what's, you know, what we've been fighting in retail for a long time is the whole online story, which um, COVID-19 has really maximized and brought to the fore because obviously everyone who could buy online and all those online stores that were open, they could trade through there. So now when retail's opened, um, and in the UK here, it opened on Monday. You know, there were lots of queues, but actually now you go anywhere and it's completely dead again. So there's that question of um, what, is, what is it that is going to get people up off their sofas into a place where they don't feel safe and secure um, to purchase something that they could purchase online. So that's got to be experiential. And that's nothing new. You know, we've talked about experiential for a long time, but what is that new experiential going to be? Because it can't be gathering lots of people in a place either. So it's a, that's a huge question for, for retail. And then if you look at the office side, it's very similar. You know, we're doing everything online. What we're doing today is, 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 is online. We don't need to get up out of our kitchens and, you know, wherever we work in at the moment and go and spend hours and hours commuting into an office. So what is that design? What is that, that what do we, how are we going to create that need to get into an office? And, you know, that sort of it could be a bit demographic in that you could see the younger people wanting to go into the office, share the time, learn how to work, you know, all of those sort of things. But generally, there's got to be a collaborative way. There's got to be, there's got to be a lot of work done in terms of making people decide to come in. So there's an experiential side, but there's also very much an information side. And that goes for retail and office. People are fearful what information, how do we get the information to them on a constant basis so that they don't feel scared, that they don't feel scared to go into a shopping mall and do shopping because everything has been set out for them. There's a two meter distance. There's, you know, everything's done. Same as in an office, you know, that it's really important that information is out there. It's clear, it's available and um, it's easy for people to get to. And the information is also sent to people. So communication for me is also vitally important in getting people back and getting people feeling safe again but just to go on the complete other end across Europe footfall has increased and um, in some of the shopping centers we do the Unibel Rodemco portfolio globally and um, in some of the countries in Europe they are up to 80% of footfall um, of February so you know it's not all doom and gloom but I think it will take a long time for it to yeah. get back to normal. With retail because so much traffic is generated over public transportation so a large port question mark I think that uh, consumers have is how safe is public transportation? Do you, how do you see in terms of whether it's, it's local, like the uh, Transport of London as an example, which runs the tube system, how are they then working with large retail platforms to maybe provide some comfort and, and expertise around this area? With great difficulties is the answer. Yeah. I mean, it is the huge elephant in the room, isn't it? 
I mean, it's a, for the for the big cities, for, you know, for sort of like London, New York, etc. This is like a is is the real problem. You can have these yeah. wonderful buildings, which are going to be operated amazingly well and incredibly safe. But how the hell do you get people there? I mean, yeah. I, I I honestly think there's a there's a the 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 reality is on um, there there will come a time when people's perception of the risk level is at a level where they'd be happy to get happy to get on on a tube and you're not really going to be able to force that you're not going to yeah. be able to force the people earlier i mean at least at last we're mandating mandating masks on masks on the tube and there's more cleaning and whatever um but i think we've 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 just got to sit it out i mean uh, 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 michelle was talking about eastern europe coming back into into retail it's the same in, in asia you know even, even in um you know in china the the big one of the biggest selling um, products in China is actually new cars because they can't get people on public transport in in China. So it it clearly is a problem. But we're we're just going to have to make extraordinary. Certainly, the big cities are going to have to make extraordinary efforts to enable people to have some trust in in the transport system. Yeah, um, and, and I, I would imagine that landlords, though, and building operators have a say in that in terms of how they then communicate. Like if you're in a common area of a building, whether it's office or retail, is wear a mask or take some of these other precautions and almost make it mandatory because that may also then provide a little bit more comfort for, for individuals to go back into these, these areas. Yeah, well, it will be interesting to see. Friends of mine in um, Hong Kong say that no, no one bothers with social distancing within within offices in Hong Kong, but everyone wears a mask That's and right. it, 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 it's mandatory because there's no point worrying about social distancing in somewhere like Hong Kong. When you walk out the building, there's 40 million people around you. So <laughs> <laughs> you, you've got to get real about these things. Yeah, I just wanted to comment on, um, on retail again. And it, it's a really interesting change because obviously before COVID, the community centers were struggling. And everyone was, you know, moving to the much bigger regional shopping centres. And that's where everyone was going. But actually, you can see that whole thing turning around now because people don't want to get into public transport and travel to the big mega schemes when they can actually do their shopping locally. And also because they've been involved in their community more and being able to work with their community actually their little shopping center in their town which probably has been dying for the last five years could actually be invigorated and be the future of of retail and and that is an absolute 100 percent turn change in the way that so, things were, so were high, high street retail in the uk could have an upswing it again could. Yeah. Or just a, a move away from the from big cities to the regions. If you know, if people yeah. were saying if, if this drags out for a long time, they're saying, well, actually, I, I, I want to go back where I grew up. It's there's more space. There's more. That's there's right. cleaner air out there. I'm not. I don't need to be in a big city. And part of being a, in a big city is enjoying the density and being around a lot of people and having that energy. But if that's no longer safe or enjoyable, will people still want to be there? Or will they will they, will they go back to it? And and the barriers to not being in the big city anymore. You know, they're mostly great jobs you can do those jobs from almost anywhere in a lot of cases now so i think that's going to be a very interesting trend as well i think that that's that's going to be interesting to pick up in terms of those broader trends i think um yasmina i just wanted to come to you because obviously you're investing in in this kind of technology um so just picking up that point that we had from the poll as well of the expectation for there to be a, a large accelerator effect um, have you seen that already, uh, I suppose, in, in some of the technology, the uptake of some of the technology that, that you've been looking at? And, and do you think that over a period of, you know, I know these things take a while to come through, but often disruption creates innovation. Um, so do you expect there to be a sort of whole new, I guess, raft of innovative new, new products, new solutions coming through over the next sort of 12 months? Yeah, sure. Um, so on the first point, definitely, um, in the same way that COVID has forced so many non-tech savvy employees to suddenly become Zoom experts, we're seeing a huge acceleration towards technology adoption in PropTech. So the real winners we've seen so far are startups that simplify processes by reducing the need for face-to-face -face interactions or digitizing physical processes, uh, for example, virtual showings and lettings and property management software. Um, so corporates are showing an increased interest in tech, which allows them to work normally, as I'm sure we've all seen, despite the pandemic. Um, and uh, we have seen that the internal hurdles that were preventing innovation have been removed. So key decisions are realizing that this is a, a different point in time. Um, 
Alongside all of that, we've also seen that a lot of crop tech platforms generate revenue for landlords or create efficiencies that improve the user's bottom line. So those groups could see even more value in the current climate. Um, and overall, you know, we think that people are quite aligned in thinking that much like the financial sector coming out of the GFC, the large institutions who adapt to technology, shift to digital and become more agile will be the winners in the future. Um, so beyond those kind of vague themes that I've, I've spoken about, uh, there are a lot of, there is a lot of potential for crop tech to shape the real estate post-COVID. So some examples of that would be uh, VR and AR, so virtual reality and augmented reality. So they can shape new ways of doing business in times where social interaction and movements are limited. Um, a lot of people on the panel have already mentioned air quality and, and measuring all of this in real time. So that's IoT hardware and software. So this can be installed to enhance tenants' well-being and increase sustainability. And another example of that would be utilization of big data and data analytics, which Anthony mentioned. Uh, so this is useful in that it provides insights on new consumer habits and market trends in the post-COVID world. So to answer the second part of your question, are we seeing an immediate uptake because of this, this sudden change in need? Unfortunately not. Um, but I think that's because it's a process, right? You know, uh, you see a need, someone thinks of a product or a solution, but then they need to go through the whole process of developing an MVP. They need to find funding in the first place. But, um, and then for them to get more funding, they need to show that they're uh, actually solving the need. And you often only see that through them uh, getting a lot of growth and traction in the amount of revenue they have or the amount of pilots that they have. So it's kind of a chicken and egg situation. Um, so hopefully one would think that in the next few years, we'll start seeing more and more of these solutions pop up. But unfortunately, we haven't really seen any uh, huge uptick in the solutions available in the last few months. Yeah. Can I just add to that? I think one of the things that we see is that different sectors are today more ready to be digitized or, or enabled. And an example of that would be multifamily, i.e. residential or student housing. And so if you look at the entire process that a prospective resident goes and looks for a unit, it's, it's fairly um, acknowledged today that the best way to do that is look online. So in the UK, whether that's link out to a Zoopla or a Rightmove, or even to the property site in a multifamily environment. And then the ability to actually choose a unit, choose different amenities, choose your duration of a lease, to, to make a payment to deposit, to do a background, i.e. a screening test, to make a payment, execute the lease online, and then receive a digital key to be able to move into the unit, as well as all of the viewings um, that are possible, as well as in terms of being able to see and visualize a unit. That's just so much more advanced in terms of how people think and the technologies available to that. And the same would be on co-working and flexible space is that, is that that particular vertical is also more advanced. I think commercial industry, uh, the overall commercial, whether it's office, retail, industrial, is still years behind on that because there's this notion that the traditional way that as a corporate occupier that I go identify a space that I want to live in or work in, uh, excuse me, would be is to go physically view all of these different spaces. And so it's the, the, the value chain and in in is, is overall is very fragmented in terms of, or the process is very fragmented. And I think a lot of work can be done there to make that more effective, um, just from an overall um, chain point of view. Well, I think that the opportunity exists for prop tech firms, but I think the opportunity also really exists for landlords in this space as well. I think the first reaction to a big disruption is, this is scary. Um, how are we going to protect ourselves? What are our risks? And I think those that then turn their mind pretty quickly to what are the opportunities that come here? Um, like Richard said earlier on, that property hasn't needed to innovate that much because everyone's been doing pretty well. Uh, but that's changed now. That's turned on its head. So I think those that react quickly, and actually there are great prop tech solutions out there that can solve a lot of these problems already. They don't have to wait for them to be invented. I know they'll get better and better over time. But I think it creates a lot of opportunities for those that want to get out there and educate themselves and learn and take advantage of it to set themselves apart and actually provide um, to the market, to the tenants, what they're looking for. And, and what they're looking for is completely different to what they were looking for last year. So I think it creates a lot of opportunity for landlords as well as prop tech firms. I think for me, it's a case of real estate really needs to work quickly to make these changes. And so my big question is, will they actually do, will they, and are they capable of working in that agile way? 
and, and will they make decisions that can have that immediate impact? Or will it take another 12 months before they can actually do that? My answer to that would be some are, some aren't. And the some that are is smaller than the some that aren't. And the some that are will, will do it and will be in a position to actually really show how strong a differentiator they've got vis-a-vis -vis their, their, com their competition. Um, because this, 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 I, I, I think part of the adoption thing is that there's a lot of attention needs to be made now into business models and what is it we are selling. I mean, I only really deal in the office markets, but my, my, my little line in there saying the, uh, the flex market is the market, I think is absolutely true. What, what's going to you, You've got the biggest occupiers of the last 10 years, all the tech companies saying, oh, come back next year. Oh, well, well half of us will go offline. You know, what, what do we care? And these are the people that took all the space. And they're saying, well, this product doesn't really suit, suit me anymore. And I've got loads of friends in the flex industry. And they're saying, well, big corporates are coming to us and saying, can you, can you sort out X, Y, Z for us? Because it's going to be easier for you to do it than us to do it. And once you, you, you get this combination of the customer saying to, to the landlords, well, I'm not sure your product really is what we want, want, want anymore. Um, it, it's, it's a massive forcing function. As, a, as I say, to, for people to say, oh, well, in that case, we need to re rethink, re rethink our strategy, rethink our business models. And once they do that, technology is going to be absolutely built into everything. At the moment, the real estate industry is a bit like, oh, well, there's a real estate industry and, oh, should we buy some tech? Whereas what it will be in the future is there is the real estate industry and tech is in everything. And I think once, once it really hits the product market fit has changed, I think you're going to find a massive amount of change over the next um, year, 18 months. And the, and the best people, it's a fantastic opportunity. It's, I, I always say it's a, the next few years is going to be a great opportunity to make a ton of money or to lose a ton of money. What you're not going to be able to do is just stay still. Yeah. And Anthony, to that point that the owners of office space, they are going to have to feel comfortable with the fact that your corporate occupiers are not going to want to have 10, 15 year leases for as much space as they've had today, but they still want flexibility in terms of maybe outsourcing some of the meeting rooms, the boardrooms, the training rooms and flexible space. So it's the owners of the assets that have to get technology enabled, but then also be willing if they're public companies to be able to reposition how they report earnings and forecasts from a revenue point of view, because your traditional whale calculation of, of what your office lease is and other components, that changes and the investment community is also going to have to understand the revenue opportunity of having, you know, corporate occupiers, traditional leases in office, plus fit, um, flexible space as organizations need more or less. But I think a lot of that is actually where, where, the, where the opportunity actually is, because the, price, the pricing point actually changes. That's I right. mean, I, I, saw, I see the future saying, well, I don't want to sell you a 15, I don't want to sell you 100,000 square feet or 10,000 square meters for 15 years. I want to sell you half of that for three months. And I'm going to provide you all this other stuff. And you're, not, and you're just going to keep renewing that because I'm going to satisfy your needs so well but you're going to take less space. You're going to take, pay a lot more for the space you do take. And so at a gross level, you're still going to be saving money, even though you're paying a lot more for your, your space. And the very best operators will be looking to fill their whole buildings on the basis of everyone is paying a lot more per square feet, but is still happy because they're saving, they're saving money overall. It's, not, it's going to be a hard, a, a hard trick. But if you look at the very best sort of flex operators, the, conven the convenes of the world, that's exactly what their game is. You will love the service we give you because it's going to be, we're going to, it's going to be so tailored to you and you'll pay us a lot of money for it and you'll be happy to do so. That's the only, that's the only way when and you're in a, if you're in a market where you've got to make someone want something as opposed to need it, the whole dynamics that changes and that's where the great yeah. opportunity is, I think. But you'll still have a density issue, right? And there's a question from the, from the, um, from the audience that says, Will will this this social distancing will it re require that corporate occupiers, as an example, request more space? And I think the answer is no, though, because they're not going to rent more space at the and incur larger costs on a monthly basis for what they occupy. But again, it's the flexible space that they need, as as you say, they want to be flexible in terms of how many people at any point in time can work from home or remotely, 
or other fringe offices rather than always in the city of London, as an example. But, but, but that's, the, that's the point, isn't it? If you've got, say, a third of your people are working from, from home at any time, a third of them are working from AN other space, you've only got a third of the people in the office. So yeah, give, right. them twice, give them twice as much space as they had before per person, and you're still saving a lot of, a lot of space. You, you, you can, once you, build, office buildings are incredibly inefficient. They are on, on average used about 50% of the time. So they're half empty anyway. Well, drop, drop the number of people who go into an office on an individual day down to half. And you could have Absolutely. quarter, quarter the total requirement, give them twice as much space, and it's still halving the total, total requirement. And we're a little ahead in New Zealand where, um, where we, you know, we've, we've sort of passed the health issue. We've, we've uh, got rid of COVID. Oh, well, actually, those two cases just started up as we had two British travellers come over uh, a few days ago. So Sorry about um, that, I don't about that. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> accept sorry. your apology. It wasn't your fault. Um, but what we are seeing, and, and obviously we're a business owner, we, we've got, um, you know, around 50 staff across two offices based in New Zealand, uh, amongst our other offices around the world. UK is actually our biggest. But um, what we're seeing now is, now that everyone can go back to work, and, and they're pretty much safe. It doesn't exist in this country, right? So there's, a, there's quite a low fear of, am I going to catch this virus here? It's almost gone. Um, and what we're seeing is actually a lot of people want to come back to the office, but they also value their flexibility. They've actually realized that some days of the week, it's really nice to wake up and work from home and they can do it productively. Um, and they really value that. And so as a business, we've learned to, to build out our flexible working policy. But even, even if everyone in the company did one day a week at home, it's obviously a 20% drop which is significant, right? Um, and of course, we now, everyone who's in the office enjoys that space more because they have more space and we can start to look at saying, well, if we don't have to pack it full of desks, what can we put in here to make this a nicer place to be and work? So it's, it's, a, it's really interesting to watch that trend um, play out here. That's good. Um, there's, the discussion has been moving at such a pace, I've struggled to write polls quick enough to, <laughs> in, in order to keep up with it. But I'll just share a couple that I've just done here because I think that, that's interesting. Uh, what percentage of your team do you expect to be working from the office full time by the end of 2020? 95 to 100 percent. Only 10 percent of people thought um, that that level of people of the team would be back in the office. Um, 26% thought that 80% uh, would be back. 40%, which was uh, the largest, um, thought that 50% would be back in the office by the end of 2020. And 24% thought it would be 30%. That was quite an interesting one. And also just to pick up on, um, uh, on this one as well, which is in, in, terms of, in terms of the crisis, has it led to a, a change in terms of your real estate strategy was 80% said yes and, uh, and 20% said no. Um, so that's interesting also in terms of the, the strategic aspect, I think. Have the panelists experienced landlord and tenants collaborating in using tech to understand and work on each other's changing requirements better. I think it's it's really important going going forward that they do work closer together. And um, you know, we, there are these um, occupier platforms that are around, which allow that um, free flow of communication to work, you know, quite effectively and efficiently between landlords and tenants. But also, there's a, a huge amount of data that sits. Um, between them as well, which enables property managers and how they're going to manage the space, but also understand the behaviours of that space as well, which is fundamental in terms of signing leases and changing the way that the space is used for landlords and occupiers. We saw this crisis coming. We had a lot of our landlords come to us very quickly and because it hit everyone so hard and they were faced with a barrage of requests from tenants, particularly around rent, rent reductions. And we realized we had an opportunity, a unique opportunity that we had uh, in the UK, about 35,000 tenancies. So um, on the platform, we had a, a very broad view across the country. So uh, what we did was we produced some reports, which we provided out to our customers into the wider market, which just showed what everyone else had agreed in different sectors and in different regions of the country. And we found the feedback we had from our landlords was that was incredibly valuable to go to their tenants because everyone realizes that it's in the landlord's best interest to keep the tenants there. They know they're in massive pain and it's all about sharing that pain. So to be able to go with the data from that system and say, look, here's what's happening in the market. We can see that rents are about 50% down um, this month and have a conversation around that actually sort of really helped to frame it. Whereas before that was out there, everyone was guessing, right? And you'd have some landlords say, uh, you have to keep paying, you've signed a lease. Another tenant say, we can't access the building, we're not paying a thing. 
Um, so that was really interesting. We were able to, you know, that was something that was able to turn around very quickly. Um, you know, something we see as a major part of the, of the strategy going forward is being able to provide that, that data-driven experience um, to help landlords and tenants make better decisions. I think it's going to be very interesting as well when retailers go back, um, you know, if, if turnover rent becomes a, a bigger play, a bigger factor at play, and, and how is that accurately measured? Um, if obviously, if you're, if you're relying on it for rent, you want to make sure it's pretty accurate if you're a landlord. Um, so that's going to be very, very interesting as well to see if, and if does turnover rent come out of just retail where it's, where it's been, will we see it bite it in different sectors? I'm not sure. But if we do, you're going to know that we need accurate data and systems to make sure it works. And I think that big data thing is going to be something also that the, there's a, there's a big focus on that at the moment. And I think that that will grow. I mean, I was interested, Yasmina, as well, that, that you were talking there about, um, AR, VR, you know, augmented reality. Um, I mean, we're obviously launching um, a real estate fair called RealX in September based around that idea of augmented reality, holographics, um, and, and being able to all meet in one place globally without actually having to travel um, and spend five days somewhere that actually everybody um, can connect if you make that connection more innovative and interesting. Um, What's, what's your sense of that? Because you're obviously investing in things where you're expecting there to be multiples of, of return. So is that sort of um, AR side of things something where, where you see a big opportunity? There's been a lot of talk for a significant amount of time about um, valuations being done by, uh, you know, different methods. Um, what's your sense of that? Is that an area that is likely to significantly grow potentially from from this crisis where people can't travel and see assets quite as easily? And if that goes on for a long period of time, that may be an issue for valuations. Possibly so. Um, unfortunately, from what I've seen of AR and VR applications to PropTech, it still seems to be quite early on in its life cycle. Um, so it's wonderful to hear about your conference and I can't wait to see what the success will be like from that. Um, hopefully, you know, if people can change their consumer behavior and really get used to something like that, we can see uh, an uptick in that. Um, however, you know, lately we, we've mostly seen it in applications to, uh, let's say, building design, allowing people to uh, kind of augment their, their architects' abilities with these AR, VR um, technologies, uh, you know, allowing people to do their lettings, allowing people to assist in their sales and the such. Um, however, when you were talking about the, uh, I guess, high potential, massive multiple investments that we do make and the technologies that, that really excite me personally, where I see a lot of potential there, that would have to be in applications of artificial intelligence. So that really, you know, harks back to the whole uh, data crunching, uh, you know, multiple sources of information and really being able to digest that in a way that only computers can and humans can't really. Um, so an example of this would be AVMs, so automatic valuation models. Um, so there is an investment manager, it's called Skyline AI, for example, um, and they're driven by AI and they use their technology to gain a competitive advantage in commercial mm -hmm. real estate investments. So through utilizing an unprecedented amount of live real estate data, they can provide the deepest, most accurate predictions about any commercial asset in the US. So if you think about it this way, it's only a matter of time before sophisticated real estate investors all utilize these data platforms and software like this to make these complicated decisions with that much physical input needed. Um, because I'm, I'm sure, as, as a lot of you know, the way that's currently done is that, you know, you have analysts that fly out to certain areas and they try and manually analyze uh, the suburbs and, and the asset and, and they try and, and, and do this all physically, whilst um, a lot of this data is already out there somewhere and it's just a matter of collecting and processing it. Where are you in terms of the adoption of PropTech? Not really aware of the solutions was 24%. Aware of the solutions but not yet implemented, 38%, and already using a number of solutions, 38%. Um, Anthony, what, what's, what's your sense of that? Does, does that mean that it picks up on your point in the, in the presentation where you see that there's still quite a long way for people to go in terms of digitalization, implementation. Well, what's your sense of that? I think perhaps the, 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 the issue is within, within the real estate industry, most people don't actually have a really good handle 
on what technology is actually able to do. They don't know, know enough about, um, ab about how the digital world works and how network effects work and ecosystems and, and all these sorts of things. And the dynamics of companies like, like Netflix or Amazon or Facebook or Apple, how, what, are the, what are their business models? How do they, how do they structure themselves? How, how do, how do they, they operate? And I, and I think there's a lack of, there, there's, there's, a, there, there's a lack of imagination fed by not enough knowledge in terms of, well, what, what should our product be? What should our service be? What is it? What is the value proposition? What is the problem we're trying to solve of who, are, who is our customer? What are their problems? How are we trying to, to solve them? What is the value proposition, proposition of that? And then working back from there to, in that case, what type of technologies do I need to, um, to implement that? I mean, you can see on the, on the, the board by the virtual board behind me, um, the Real Innovation Academy is actually an online course that we've started. Uh, my friend of mine, Draw Poleg in uh, New York and I, were actually thinking about this before, before lockdown and then uh, we're ready to go in lockdown. And what that is, is it, it, it's a course that teaches technology people about real estate and real estate and real estate people about technology. And it's been fascinating working through the first cohort where we've had people from 17 different countries across five, five continents. And as is always the case, people tend to know an awful lot about what they know about and what their industry is, and not that much about other people's. And you need to, we, we, need, to, we need to get much better at melding all the different skill sets and a much broader reach of where we're taking influences from and as I say, working from there to, um, to understand, well, how can I develop a, a value proposition that's 10 times better than my competitors? And then what do I need to, to produce that? So it's slightly working away. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not a fan of what I call um, prop tech shopping, where people just go, oh, well, well, let's go and have a look what prop tech's out there and see what we can buy. That's completely the wrong way to do it. You have to start, you have to start with the customer and then work back from that. And right, in that case, I need something that does X and then go, and then go and look, look for X. So it's a, it's a stage on the, 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 the industry evolution cycle. But again, I think that, I think you'll find this year, people are going to obsess about this and actually think, oh my God, we really need to get into this quickly. And are going to make a lot more effort to bring themselves up, up to speed across the board. And then, and then you'll get a lot more adoption because you'll be able to, People will see where the differentiation can come from. Yeah, and Anthony, I think those are great comments. If I can maybe just add a few things, I think the first thing to realize is that there's always been innovation in real estate, right? So prop tech is a great new phrase, and it's done during a period of time where you have insure tech, legal tech, prop tech, etc. And the creation of a new acronym or a phrase kind of reminds me of 20 years ago, which was the dot com era where it did the same, right? So there's always been innovation, but there's different phases of the life cycle of innovation by which the, the availability of cloud computing, cloud storage, processing, um, better programming languages, smartphones, accelerates all of that. I think one of the biggest things that companies forget is that data is important. And by the way, it's always been important. So this phrase that data is the new oil, well, data has always been important, right? Because you've always had a network effect of within real estate because real estate has always understood that if you have a building in a certain part of the, 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 the city and you have Goldman Sachs, then you can probably attract other like, you know, type of minded companies. And with that, you get a higher value per area, right? So there's always been that, but there's this then shift that says, what's that next phase of, how do you create the next phase of the network effect? But I think too many companies today focus on, oh, PropTech is a better visualization of something or a, a neat looking tool or a smartphone developed tool without getting their house in order of making sure that their data set is correct. Because without the core data, you can't do anything beyond that. You can't apply machine learning. You can't apply AI. It's much tougher to integrate into multiple different disparate systems. It's much tougher to manage a portfolio across multiple different asset sectors. And it's also much more difficult as, as capital goes across regions and asset classes to be able to manage all of that with a single view. And so I think I, you know, remind everyone that sometimes it's not as difficult as it seems, but you have to start with a strong foundation to be able to grow from and then create strategies around that. 
Okay, good. Um, there's, there's a question that came in on the chat, which was totally agree, property people, and I am one, um, are not at all aware of what tech can do. Um, so this is a kind of question, that, and I'm going to pick up on this from everybody. Um, a, what can tech do for, the, for them as, for our audience here and for others as, as property people? Um, so what can it actually do? And also, because you're coming from a slightly different um, side of the discussion, Yasmina, um, for you, I mean, we've already discussed that, that change is, is imminent. So how does somebody also get involved? How does somebody jump on board? Um, you know, how do they get involved in that part of it as well? So maybe we'll start with you, Yasmina, just on how people can get on board and then, and then a quick point from everybody else about what, it, what, you know, what can people benefit from so that, so that then people are more aware of what the advantages are. Um, Yasmina, just start with you. Of course. Um, so I think as Neil was saying, you don't know what you don't know. So awareness is really key. So you need to educate yourself. You need to keep on board of or keep on top of what's out there. You need to be open to um, trying new solutions once you really understand your own core business um, and see what benefits you can enjoy. Because I'm sure you guys will cover this later, but the benefits are limitless. You know, uh, any part of, of your, your real estate journey it can be through design or construction, property management, property investment, prop tech can, uh, useful, uh, proper use of prop tech can allow you to save money, um, you know, optimize space, um, cut down on costs, make your tenants happier. It can do pretty much anything if you use it properly. Um, so step one, know what's out there. Step two, I would recommend you jump on board and try and capture some of the financial upside. So be open to investing in startups yourself, or if you don't have the experience and expertise, I'm going to be a little cheeky here, but you can invest a small ticket into a PropTech VC fund like Round to Adventures. <laughs> okay, good. Um, Michelle, just, just, just pick up on that um, in, in terms of, um, I suppose, what solutions are available. And it might be interesting also, because you may be picking this up in terms of the sort of people getting back shopping, people getting back to work. Are there kind of shorter term things that, that PropTech can be very useful for and also some of the longer term ones? I think um, for me, uh, just to go back a step, I think strategy is really important. And, you know, to know where you're going and then to choose the tech that's going to help you along the way. And it's going to be a longish journey because you can't do everything in, in one go. But what you can do is start now and get the tech on board that's going to grow with your company and grow with your business. Because tech isn't something that you just put in and it never changes. It actually changes and grows with you. So, you know, you, you go in simple and then build with your complexity as you go along. So that, I think, is really important. Um, in terms of what can tech do, I think both in retail and in offices and in any real estate, you want immediate return on investment. And in order to do that, you need to start automating or digitalizing some of your operations, some of your communications, be that in, you know, be that talking to your customer who works, who walks through the door or talking to your tenants or talking to your head offices. And you can create many different layers of, of communication. So I think that's really important. But I think um, create, tech will give you that agility that um, real estate doesn't have at the moment. So in order to do all the things that we've been talking about for the last hour, actually tech is going to help real estate become agile. And I think that's really important. Okay, good. Neil? Um, I want to maybe answer it on two different sides. So one would be is, is for the entrepreneurs out there in terms of prop tech, in terms of why do I develop? Why do I invest in a company? Why does one look for an exit? Um, don't develop product, val develop value, a value proposition that is unbeatable, right? It's easy to develop product. And I think this is where people get it wrong is that they don't understand the value proposition and the willingness of pay and how they can differentiate and defend. So those things all keep, you know, are, are top of mind as, as we work with, with startups or we do acquisitions or just from previous lives too. And I would say that's an important statement also to the individuals or the companies that are then looking to leverage off of, of uh, prop tech and startups is that if you look at a scenario in Silicon Valley by which one in a hundred companies survives in, in periods of time when capital is, is loose, there's a lot of startups. It's very difficult to understand though, in terms of which one is going to survive. So be patient and focus uh, on that. I would say then for organizations in terms of what does technology and real estate mean, 
I would say basic building blocks in terms of if you're not in the cloud yet, move into the cloud. And the starting point could be is just move to Microsoft Office 365 and SharePoint in the cloud as an example. And you know, the, 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 as, as people started working from home, I think a lot of organizations forgot that they're not digitally enabled and, and that makes it hard to collaborate both internally with their employees as well as with their customers and their prospects. And then build upon there. There's lots of solutions out there, whether it's focused on better means of payments, better communications, leveraging off of notifications via smartphones, just a number of things, but get the house in order and build some, uh, invest in basic building blocks. Okay, great, Tom. I agree with Neil, I agree with Michelle that at, at the start it's, um, if you're new to PropTech, it can seem a little bit overwhelming. Um, so I think what's important is to look at, look at what problems you have or what problems you're looking to solve in your business, which areas do you think you can improve on, and then go out there and look for those specific, decision, uh, specific solutions that focus on that. I think the cloud is a, a great place to start. It's, a, it's almost a no-brainer. We can see that you get access, your team can collaborate, you can have access wherever you are. Um, so it's going to really secure your business there. But it's really about, it's a never-ending thing, right? So it's an education piece that you go on with. So you'd start with something simple and small and build that out over time. The benefits are, are clear in terms of running a, a more efficient business, a more connected business. You've got a, more, a business using tools that are more user-friendly. So there's less risk if someone in your business leaves that's been with you for a long time. It's easier for a new person to come in and be trained up. Further to that, though, I get really excited about once you have this modern technology in place, what you can do if you've chosen the right systems is now you have a platform where you can do things, you can access your data in a way that you haven't been able to access your data before, which is going to create new opportunities for you, create new insights for you, uh, new, new opportunities to drive your business forward, whether that is looking at how do your costs compare to your peers in the market, for example. If you've got no insight into you know, uh, what your costs are for security or uh, services or air quality, how does that compare? So being able to look at that and understand that with your data and compare it to other people um, is some of the really exciting things that are enabled and unlocked by investing in the right prop tech um, now, basically. Okay, good. Um, Anthony? What is the real estate business? Real estate business is about com commercializing space. You know, how, how much revenue can we generate out of a, out of a, a space? But the world, we're, the world we're going into is moving from one where what we were selling was just that space to selling just that space is just dumb at the moment. That's, that's, just, that's just the hardware. Unless we are, add software and services to it, um, we're not going to be able to sell a better user experience. Because ultimately, in terms of commercializing space, the way to generate the most, uh, the most rev revenue is to create the best user experience of, of that space. So the same, this is going to obviously apply in retail. You know, I don't need to go to a shop to go shopping, but there are still places I love going to because they're just fabulous and amazing and one wonderful. That's creating a great user, user experience. But if you, if you take um, the, the, the workplace, which is the main area I, I look at, if you think about it like this, if you're, if you're selling um, workplace to someone on 10, 15 year leases, from the real estate industry's point of view, once that's done, that's done. We don't care. I don't care if you like your space, use it well, or any, any, anything, because you're on, on the hook. It's a completely different ball game when someone's doing it every three months or six months or nine months or, or 12, 12 months. I got to get the mo I got to be able to generate the most income out of you and get you to renew. So I need to create a great user experience. So I need to understand how my building is working. So if we go back to environmental conditions, what's the lighting, the air quality and uh, noise and temperature and all that sort of stuff. I need to understand how well that's working. I need to understand how my space is being used. How are my customers actually using it? Where are they going? Where are they not going? Where are they loitering? And then what is it they're doing? What are their jobs to be done each day? And do they have the right space that enables them to do what they need to do as well as they can possibly do it. All of that needs a ton of data, a ton of technology, and a ton of really advanced, sophisticated human skills. This is a human plus machine, machine game. So what the technology enables you to do, added to strong human skills, is ultimately create a much better user experience. And if you can create a much better user experience, one way or another, you will generate more money out of your dumb space. 
Thanks very much to all of the speakers and, and you also uh, for your questions um, and all of your comments. Um, it's been a really interactive session um, and, and thanks very much for, for sharing your time with us today. Um, the next event that we're running um, is on the 23rd of June at 9.30, um, focused on Iberia. But until then, thanks very much for joining us. Um, look forward to seeing you in the next one. And in the meantime, stay well, stay safe and stay connected. Thank you.